Hello, everyone. My name is Suzanne Nielsen, and it's a pleasure to be here today to interview Sarwar uh, Kashmiri about his new monograph, The Telegram. I am a student of international affairs, a political scientist, and I'm also the head of the Department of Social Sciences uh, at West Point. And although uh, I uh, have those affiliations, I would want to make clear that, um, and even though I'm the interviewer and not the interviewee, that everything I say today should be taken to be my personal opinion and should not be taken to represent the official positions of the United States Military Academy, the United States Army, or the Department of Defense. So now, uh, having made that clear, uh, I do want to uh, introduce our are really the host of Polaris Live, uh, but the individual I'll be interviewing today, uh, Sarwar Kashmiri. He is uh, a fellow with the Foreign Policy Association and the author of a number of books. What I'm going to be talking to him about today is his recent monograph about U.S.-China foreign relations uh, called The Telegram. Uh, so Sarwar, it's uh, great to be here and be with you today. Well, Suzanne Nielsen, uh, we go back some years, uh, but today is the first time I come before you with uh, uh, some severe shivers about being interviewed. Uh, you're a star in the uh, firmament of uh, instructions, and but I'm here at your disposal. All I ask is be gentle. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate that, and I I, I want to just start off by thanking you for for adding to really what is the sen seminal debate in our age, which is how ought we to think about uh, the future relations between uh, these two great uh, countries, uh, whose relationship is most likely to shape international affairs, and of course, uh, that's the United States and China. So I want to start uh, with a question that relates to the theme of your report, uh, again called the Telegram. Uh, which proposes a new agenda for the Biden administration towards China. Of course, the name The Telegram is a deliberate reference to John F. Uh, Kennan's 1946 long telegram that he wrote from Moscow back to the State Department in the United States, trying to explain to the American foreign policy community really the, so the sources of Soviet conduct and how that ought to shape uh, U.S. foreign policy into the 20th century. Uh, so uh, what I would like to do is actually draw on that parallel and ask you, uh, in the process of writing this report and just in general, when you think about the sources of Chinese conduct here in the 21st century, what do you think are the two to three things that Americans understand least well about uh, China's behavior? Well, thank you for that uh, question, Suzanne. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, the telegram, I mean, George Kennan has been someone that I've admired uh, for a long, long time. And there was, a, the, there was a brief moment there when I thought, gee, can I really be calling this the telegram? He called his report the long telegram, as you know. Uh, I said, that's a little bit pompous or so on. But I did want to have that name in there because of what that meant. And you've explained that uh, so clearly. Uh, but first of all, the thing that still impresses me, Suzanne, about uh, George Kennan's uh, seminal uh, work is that it took 40 years for the Soviet Union to implode. And he had laid out in such an elegant and simple manner why the United States should follow a containment policy. Uh, and not think about going to war because the Soviet Union would ultimately collapse. It just didn't have, uh, you know, the uh, the money or the technology or the industry to keep going. Uh, as the late Senator McCain used to say, you know, he said it of Russia, but it's a uh, bankrupt gas station. And that to some extent, you know, still, uh, still holds. Uh, he gave Americans the idea about why containment sh will work and should be followed. And in my opinion, to your question now, is there are three things that uh, most Americans do not, I believe, understand about the Soviet Union. Uh, one is how rich and technologically advanced it is, right? And depending on how you count GDP, uh, it is today already the largest economy in the world. If you count it in purchasing power parity terms, as a lot of economists think is more more accurate, right? So, and the second thing they don't understand is how strong it is. Uh, so over the last 20 years, 
uh, China has developed land, space, sea, airborne weapons to do one thing, to make its coast impregnable. Uh, and, uh, and today, from everything I know, uh, and some of the books that are now coming out, the American aircraft carriers, the nuclear powered carriers, uh, which is how most of our uh, forces projected overseas, cannot operate within a thousand kilometers of the Chinese coastline. Simply, they'll be sunk. And the third thing is that China is an authoritarian government, right? We all know that. Uh, but the Chinese people seem to be very happy with it, right? The recent Harvard study, the Pew Research Report shows uh, Mr. Xi Jin, President Xi Jinping, uh, popularity in China has grown from late 70s to over 90s at this point. So I think those are the three things that we need to keep in mind as we think about, uh, about policy for China. Well, thanks. I think that's a really helpful place to start. What I'd like to do, dig into first, is uh, is China's Belt and Road Initiative, something on which you've written a lot, uh, previous book, uh, prior, as well as this report. And in this report, you are generally favorable about China's uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, for any who are not following is China's massive infrastructure program under which it's constructing roads, tunnels, bridges, ports, and uh, other high technology products, uh, uh, projects in about 130 countries now in Asia, Europe, uh, and a Africa. And in the process of doing this, China is building a number of significant commercial partnerships. Uh, but I want to contrast uh, your generally positive view of that uh, whole endeavor with a recent Co Council on Foreign Relations Task Force report, which argues, in contrast, that and then it uses an acronym for uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which is BRI. The Council on Foreign Relations report argues that BRI's risks outweigh its benefits. Uh, and it provides several indictments saying BRI undermines global mac macroeconomic stability by lending funds to unsustainable projects, uh, thereby adding to countries' uh, debt burdens in an unsustainable way. It locks countries into carbon intensive futures by promoting coal-fired uh, power plants, tilts the, pl the playing field in major markets toward Chinese companies, promotes exclusive reliance on Chinese technology, and draws countries into a tighter economic and political relationship with Beijing, again, intended to be a relatively exclusive set of ties. So I think that this is a Although I drew on that one one report, I think this is kind of a summary of the critiques that are of BRI that are out in the in the broader literature, and I wonder how you might just start out by responding to that. Now you know this is not fair because you told me you'd be giving me softballs. This is a really tough <laughs> question, but Suzanne, you have hit the nail on the head. This is the establishment criticism of the Belt and Road Initiative, and I must tell you that I do not agree with the uh, Council on Foreign Relations conclusions in this instance. And let me give you two reasons why. Uh, first of all, uh, early this year, uh, the uh, uh, Anna Gelpern, who's a professor at Georgetown Law, uh, she and her group studied over th uh, two and a half years, a hundred projects uh, that Belt and, I, Belt and Road Initiative uh, has has financed. And they came to the conclusion that the process that China follows in lending money is much more commercial than governmental. And if you uh, take a look, for example, at the uh, projects in uh, Africa, many of them are guaranteed by the host country uh, by tying in commodities, copper, and so on, so that uh, the repayment terms are uh, made by payments of these natural resources. And, uh, and uh, the, the Georgetown report pointed out that this is very similar to the pay-as-you-go process that is followed by commercial corporations, where, for example, they will build a road, a highway, uh, and then they will take the money back let's say over 20 years by operating toll roads on it. So that's, that's, that's one recent report. Uh, the other one that I would tell you is uh, Professor uh, Deborah Brodigan at Johns Hopkins. 
She runs something, Suzanne, that you may know is called the Africa Center. It is the go-to place uh, for analyzing loans uh, that are made under the BRI. And she recently wrote an op-ed in which she said that there is not one single instance where China has lent more money than a country can pay and wound up by taking back the assets that it was funded. So you put those two together, and I think that there is a great deal of apprehension. And to some extent, uh, and I'm sorry to say this, to some extent, this is a herd mentality that is driven more by an inability of America to compete in the open market for the hearts and minds and these projects. I mean, you may know we've pretty much given up on, uh, you know, helping other countries finance large projects. We haven't done anything for a long time. Uh, and uh, and uh, so that's where that comes from. Uh, and this idea that China lends uh, fossil fuels and other uh, dirty energy now, that is true, but it's a very complicated process. I mean, if you look at people in India and, and other countries that are developing but are large consumers of energy like America is and like China is, they will tell you that, gee, it's great for you folks to sit up there. You know, after 100 years, you have emitted all the carbon dioxide the world needs to get to the level where you are now industrially and economically. So why are you telling us to slow down? We'll slow down when we come to your uh, level. But leaving that aside, I think China is responding to the pressure that you outlined. So beginning this year, for the first time, we see Chinese policy changing about, about dirty energy, coal, and so on. Uh, in, in March or April of this year, I forget, forget the exact date, uh, Bangladesh uh, came up with a BRI project and China wrote back to the to the energy minister and said, we are now driving a policy to not fund polluting energy or polluting industries. So with the pressure that America and other countries have, uh, have put on China, they are starting to move away from that. So you put all of that together and there are huge success stories on the BRI, no success stories where they've taken over a project for lack of payment and they're lending as commercial enterprises do, not the World Bank and the uh, uh, and so on that follow more governmental rules. Yeah, I did see, uh, it was interesting that when President Xi Jinping was before the UN, uh, just this past couple of weeks, did yes. announce that they were not doing any new uh, projects that were uh, coal power uh, based, although I, I guess there's quite a few projects in the pipeline, so people are still trying to, to sort out the significance mm -hmm. of, of that announcement. Um, but I wonder if I could uh, stay on that topic for a second. Uh, I think probably one of the, one of the recommendations that you make that's perhaps most uncommon and definitely not um, definitely not something that the mainstream foreign policy establishment I think embraces is this idea that the United States itself ought to uh, become a participant in the Belt and Road Initiative. Right. Um, so could you explain uh, how you would make that argument that this is in the national interest to do for the United States to become a BRI participant? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I will. And you know, I have, I have to admit in hindsight, if I was, uh, uh, redoing this report, I would not use the word America should join the BRI. I should I should have used another phrase, which was not uh, politically uh, on fire, something like uh, America should try to leverage uh, the, the BRI. And let me give you where this thinking comes from. Uh, America is already leveraging companies that are a large part of the BRI even though it's not common knowledge. And let me give you two examples. First of all is the commuter train uh, situation in Boston, which had very old rail cars, uh, which were running out uh, of time. Uh, and so they let out a tender uh, and all the big companies in the world who do uh, rail cars, infrastructure projects, uh, apply Kawasaki, Hyundai, Bombardier, and so on. Uh, and the Chinese company, uh, China's uh, Railway Rolling Stock Corporation, CRRC, uh, which is a big player in the Belt and Road Initiative, won. Uh, 
Uh, I talked to the uh, cabinet official who worked for the then governor who was in charge of this project, and he told me that they won, not because they were 20 million lower than the other peer, other folks, but they were the only one who said that they would build a factory in Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, and that on uh, on researching them, uh, the Massachusetts government found that they were the only ones of the people that came in who stuck to their schedule. Everyone else had delayed in their projects. So they were chosen for that. And, uh, and, uh, and what happened, there was a factory that was shuttered that now employs 200 people that assemble these rail cars. Massachusetts is starting to export them to Los Angeles. As the Wall Street Journal pointed out that Massachusetts is now uh, starting to export them to Los Angeles, to Philadelphia, to Chicago, right? So this is a major, major project. I'll give you another one. And this is uh, the uh, port of Portsmouth uh, in Virginia. Uh, uh, Suzanne, most people don't know this, but, but uh, goods that are shipped from Asia to America come in container ships. They're put in containers, they come in container ships. And these container ships now can hold 20, 22,000 containers. Can you imagine? They come all the way from China in these huge, they have to be unloaded. They require these giant gantry cranes. Uh, and and, and the, the big customers of Portsmouth said, hey, listen, unless you're able to start handling these giant ships, we'll have to move our business elsewhere. We'll go to Montreal, we'll go to other core. And so Portsmouth and Virginia did what Los Angeles and other ports in America have done, which is order them from the only company that builds them, which is in China. So in this report that you mentioned uh, at the beginning of this program, there's a picture of these six giant gantry cranes coming on a barge from China. They cost 12 million each. Now, this was during the Trump presidency. And Mr. Trump said, not going to allow it. This is China's infrastructure builder. We'll charge tariffs. We'll do duties. And, and uh, Virginia said, OK, I guess we just then give up all this business. And Mr. Trump, to his credit, said, no, no, no. Go ahead on this. It will be an exception. So here are two ways in which we already, we, the US, are already a part of companies that are big players in the in the BRI, right? So that is one piece of it. Sorry, this is a long answer, Suzanne. I should follow you when you speak at uh, your place. You know, you always have these tight answers. I'm still learning that art. But here's the other piece of it. Here's the other piece. Of it. The, to his credit, Mr. Biden has asked for money for American infrastructure. Right. I mean, the American Society of Civil Engineers, you know, said, I'll give you one example, that there, that, that there are hundreds and hundreds of miles of highways, one mile in every five of highways and major roads in America needs to be repaired. There are 45,000 bridges that need to be repaired. Our infrastructure is in such horrible shape that the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers said it will take two trillion dollars a year for 10 years to repair it, without which we continue losing productivity and competitiveness. Two trillion a year for 10 years is 20 trillion. Mr. Biden, to his credit, has asked for 1.3 trillion, which I'm not certain he's going to get because of all the problems in Congress. So there's a huge delta, right? Huge difference between what it's going to take to get our infrastructure up to date and, 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 and the amount of money that is being uh, attempting, he's attempt, Mr. Biden is attempting to, to get. Meanwhile, Wall Street uh, firms have raised enormous amounts of money for infrastructure, which is not going anywhere. So my question is, can we not, can we not say, hey, is there a way that we can use Chinese technology Chinese expertise in building infrastructure, the expertise that's built the largest uh, high-speed rail system of any country, all the countries in the world put together, that has used more concrete in three years than America has, has in all of the 19th, sorry, 20th century, one that's built 50, uh, you know, major cities in 20 years. Can we not use that technology American workers, Wall Street money, in really making a difference in our infrastructure. 
I could go on about this, but that's you know where I where I where I come from. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to make that kind of an economic uh, efficiency argument uh, in some ways that it seems to really get at a core uh, a part of the American self-image, which is that the United States brings know-how uh, to the projects that it engages in domestically and and uh, mm -hmm. around the world. I'm wondering, you know, along the lines of those arguments, in part, uh, what that suggests is uh, just treat uh, Chinese companies like any other potential supplier. And if they offer a competitive bid, uh, that they should be uh, part of these projects. But I'm trying to think about that in the context in which the political discourse about the about China and the United States has is, is grown much more, uh, much more negative to the point, actually, where there was a February 2021 Pew poll in which 89% of Americans uh, consider China to be either a competitor or an enemy uh, rather than a partner. And I'm wondering, uh, what are the realistic political mm -hmm. prospects for particularly US federal government funded right. uh, infrastructure projects uh, drawing uh, as, as you recommend on Chinese technology, Chinese know-how, as opposed to what's available within the United States? Right. So first of all, I'd say there's not much available in the United States. We neither have the money nor, I believe, the kind of technology that China has, right? So that's one part of it. The second part of it, and here, uh, this may, this may uh, surprise you, but I'm thinking that total bipartisanship, Suzanne, is not good. I mean, we've been criticizing the lack, the breakdown in Washington, but I'm just wondering whether total bipartisanship agreement is really good for the country. I mean, here we have the entire, literally, as you've uh, pointed out, uh, the, the entire establishment, China establishment expertise that calls China an enemy. There isn't a way that an opposing view can find itself into the center of Washington because all years are closed. Republicans, Democrats, Independents are all aligned and saying, this is our enemy. Yeah. And I think that's very dangerous. I mean, competition, yes. You know, uh, let's think of it like a football team, com fiercely competitive, but it improves each side. But why enemy? I mean, if heaven forbid we ever get into a war, then we won't have anything to worry about. I mean, they have enough nuclear missiles to wipe out America and the rest of the world. We have the same thing. So if there's a war, we don't have anything to worry about. But why call them an enemy? Right. So, uh, so, and and the other part of this is, of course, uh, that they will spy on us. I mean, this point was made by Congress when Boston went out and got these commuter cars and, you know, people in Boston pointed out, are you crazy? I mean, are they going to spy on people with their briefcases and backpacks going to work in the morning? And I don't believe, I mean, we're technologically sophisticated, the United States. And I just think that whole thing is exaggerated. And I think that we really need to bug this trend. We can't keep calling them an enemy. I mean, look at what happened to the chief of staff of the, uh, of, the, of the United States military. I mean, when there was trouble and we have, let me use this word, a renegade president who was uh, uh, the military and most experts thought going to go to war with China to save his skin. The chief of staff of the U.S. military, the highest ranking uniformed uh, person, you know, calls his counterpart in China and he says, hey, if the crazies in Washington are going to do a surprise attack on China. I'll call you. Now, what better example can you have of trust between the two countries? Yeah, I guess the to me that it sort of avoids the central point of distrust, which is that when uh, when the United States, particularly uh, the U.S. government, is perhaps bidding and there are private sector actors involved, then it might be acceptable to say who can deliver the highest quality product at the lowest possible price. But with the People's Republic of China, it's, uh, there is not the same philosophy about mm -hmm. a separation between state and private enterprise. And the notion that 
regardless of how these uh, companies in China uh, are presenting themselves, that uh, there would be nothing that would stop the People's Republic of China from asserting control over a company in a way and causing the company to take action uh, that would be contrary to national interests. So for example, even if even if the reasons for distrust for Huawei didn't exist, there would be nothing stopping uh, the PRC in the future from asserting control over the whatever information technology infrastructure Huawei built around the world in the future. So. It seems like that fundamental difference between the relationship between the government and the private sector uh, in China is a fundamental source of the distrust that doesn't necessarily have to be tinged with partisan color in order to be a legitimate source of concern. Sure. Uh, and, uh, and, and to be truthful, I'm so bullish on doing what I've just explained to you, but it does take two hands to clap, as my dear mother always told me. And the Chinese have to understand, in the words that you've just expressed, why it's going to be difficult to do these projects, no matter what, and that they need to do their part in, in building the kind of trust and working on smaller projects with the United States till we can get to this point. I mean, it's not, uh, let me take the example of a recent example from Israel. Right, they developed this software that implants itself on iPhones, and you know uh, this was used to bug Merkel. This was used to bug Macron. Lately, it's been used to for some other world leaders. So, I mean, countries, but but yet we have the closest relationship with Israel. Why? Because we've worked with them over so many years. We trust them largely implicitly, uh, and we can continue working through this. And that's what I believe China needs to be doing and needs to think about. So yes, I agree with you. And I would like to at some point uh, talk about this submarine issue, you know, and why that can be a start for uh, a new start for China and America. Well, that's a great segue. So I, I was actually just about to, to ask you about that. You know, just less than two weeks ago, uh, the United States, the UK and Australia came up with a uh, new uh, arrangement, the AUKUS uh, security partnership to foster peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. And as you know, uh, and I think you were just alluding to one of the major initiatives was to uh, facilitate the introduction of nuclear powered, not nuclear weapons capable, but nuclear powered yes. uh, submarines into mm -hmm. the naval fleet of Australia, yes. which would be a dramatic increase in Australia's uh, cap uh, mm -hmm. naval capability. Um, I'm curious on how you do think this development affects your, your recommendations. Sure. Uh, so I have, I have a two-part answer to that. First of all, I commend the administration for what they did. This is a strategic move, I think, that a lot of uh, people, I find myself in the camp of those who are waiting for. Right? It goes to the heart of where this pivot to... Uh, so-called pivot to Asia get you know, will get its energy energy from. But you know, Suzanne, this is uh, what I've been thinking since that was announced. Uh, China has spent the last two decades making sure the world understands that the South China Sea, the East China Sea is their backyard. They, as you know, claim almost all of it, right? And they're, they're de determined they're not going to give it up because their life depends on it. Not, using rhetoric. Now, with the submarine de uh, deal, uh, America, it seems to me, has made it clear to China, hey, look it, you've told us all about your national, vital national interest for the last two decades. Well, guess what? Here's this deal because we too have vital national interests in that area. So it seems to me both sides now have reached a point of quote unquote balance. I think both sides now understand that the other side has vital national interest in it. So it seems to me that the time is right to start small projects that can start that can begin building the trust that we talked about just a moment earlier. And I think we're already in that direction because just two days ago, uh, the Huawei CFO. Uh, this lady who had been imprisoned in Canada awaiting extradition to the U.S., the Justice Department settled her case, 
she was let go to China. China, in turn, returned the two diplomats from Canada that that it had it had imprisoned. Right. So that uh, I would now like to see us build on that. For example, they are already talking about Mr. Kerry going back to China to talk about the environment. Uh, as our viewers probably know, uh, the last time Mr. Kerry was there a few weeks ago, the Chinese said, "Hey." If you think that we're only going to talk about the environment, you know, you're smoking something. We need to talk about all the problems that are on the table before us. And Mr. Kerry came back. Well, now he's planning to go back. And I hope that China will say, you know what, let's just talk about the climate. Do another small piece. And I think in return, uh, Mr. Biden should think about removing the tariffs, removing the uh, uh, removing the uh, duties on Chinese products, because from all evidence, uh, from the American side, they're hurting our farmers and industrialists more than they're hurting the Chinese, right? So here are steps that we can go through, and maybe in time we we'll lead to this BRI project. Maybe in time we we'll lead to a joint uh, relationship to establish something huge to tackle pandemics. That's what I'm thinking, and I hope it goes in that direction. So I appreciate that. I think, um, I mean, I'm not sure that there's, I think what your point gets at is is what many foreign policy experts are talking about in terms of trying to figure out, while acknowledging competition, how to find areas for, for cooperation. And so I think um, if there are uh, those avenues, uh, I think that uh, many would be interested. But I wanna just broaden the aperture a little bit in terms of trying to think about uh, the role that a once again uh, powerful, uh, perhaps dominant in Asia, China, will play in international affairs. Uh, and this has to do with the rules-based international order that has helped to uh, govern international affairs coming out of the Second World mm -hmm. War. So in peace and security led by the UN, in international finance, economics, and trade, uh, there have been a number of institutions that have had huge impact on fostering cooperation in international affairs. Some have pointed out that China has uh, begun to participate uh, more fulsomely in this liberal international order in institutions like the UN. Others, and I wanted to hearken here to Bonnie Glazer, who you cite in your report, talks about the fact that, that China's participation is in somewhat associated with an effort to rewrite the principles and the norms of these institutions. So an example would be rather than emphasis on free market forces and individual freedom and liberties, uh, China would uh, push for a model that accepted state-directed economic activity and emphasize sovereignty over universal uh, sense of human rights that were individual based. So I'm wondering, uh, how do you think about this? Uh, is there still, um, if China were to redefine these norms and principles, would we would we really want to say that the liberal international uh, economic uh, liberal international order has survived, or should we really recognize that it has been transformed and perhaps maybe even in the future supplanted? Boy, what a wonderful question, right? And uh, uh, let's see where do I, let me start with uh, again. I'll quote the Wall Street Journal of a few a couple of months ago when they talked about this very issue. And they said, what China is trying to do is change, influence, uh, impact the world order and the norms from the inside. And they said that, uh, you know, because uh, this is the order under which they've become rich. Right? They've been able to raise, what, 900 million people from poverty into lower middle class in this order. But here's the thing, Suzanne, this so-called liberal world order came up after the Second World War, right? When America was the only country standing. And, and, and thanks to some phenomenal leaders like George Marshall and Dean Acheson, and Adenauer on the European side, Schumann and, and others, they came up with all of these organizations, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, and so on, that has kept the peace largely for all of these 60, 70 years, 
uh, and has uh, also uh, prevented countries from going to war and, and, and risen. I mean, there was nothing standing beside America at the end of the war. Now, uh, Europe does more business with China than, uh, than, uh, than America does, right? Uh, so, however, there's one thing that was missing in this arrangement, and that is another China, another uh, force that is as rich as the United States and as rich as the European Union, right? A country that is authoritarian, a country that has different ideas of how its people will benefit. So the question is, how does this order, the question I submit is, how does this world order that has kept everything together for 70 years come into being with a new, sorry, get influenced by a China that has a different governance system. I mean, there's no question that the order can't keep going on and dictate terms now to a China that is richer uh, than the United States are going to be. Uh, and how does one square that circle? It, to, it seems to me that's a seminal foreign policy and economic issue. And so far, China seems to be doing that from the inside. They're trying to influence, right? They're in 20 United Nations bodies trying to change some of the norms. But I don't believe there's that much to worry about. What I worry about is America disengaging. I mean, how are they able to do this? The world, to me, when I travel around, there's more love for America than there is for China. I mean, I'm not saying this to, to insult China or anything, but that being the case, we need to re-engage. We need to be a part of the world order. We need to, you know, uh, be part of the multilateral institutions so that we can win from the inside as opposed to China. So they're competing. We need to compete. That's how I would see it, Suzanne. Yeah, no, I think that's an interesting uh, way of thinking about it. Um, I wanted to turn, uh, only because time is slipping away on us, to another one of your recommendations, uh, which was uh, you suggested, again, I think as part of this effort to try to build trust in the, in the partnership, uh, that one of the initiatives might be the building of a joint strategic pandemic command, which would oh. uh, be set up to orchestrate rapid global responses to future uh, global health crises. And I just want to sort of challenge the feasibility of that a little bit and just see what you would say. I think that uh, where we stand today, there's still a great deal of distrust, at least within the United States, about uh, the origins of COVID-19 and a great sense of frustration about uh, China's unwillingness to enable uh, impartial investigations for, on a scientific basis that would contrast the various theories of the, of the virus's origins, whether it be zoonotic, whether it were to have originated in a lab, and in a context in which there is a current global health crisis that China has been uncooperative or at least uh, not transparent, is there really a prospect that, uh, that the United States could think of China as a meaningful partner in the face of future ma major global health crises? By the way, I agree with you. Uh, uh, most of what you've said, I think uh, I'm anyway convinced, and I'm not an expert in this, but I'm convinced that China did try to hide when 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 COVID first broke out in Wuhan. I think they tried to hide it. Pretty soon, found out that they couldn't. It was much larger than what they uh, what they had uh, thought it was. No question in my mind that they tried to do that. I think all the evidence is there. But then they turned around and they all broke it down, the DNA, you know, the genome structure of, uh, of it, and they made that available to everybody, <clears throat> right? So that's the other part of this. Now, it is true that they're not being as transparent as we would like them to be. But I would submit, I would submit, Suzanne, that making themselves transparent uh, assumes a certain level of trust. And I believe that in China today, they think that America is just doing this. And I mention America because that's what we are talking about. America is just doing this 
wants to know all this because they want to turn around, hit us on the head and say, see, yeah, we knew you guys were responsible for this all along. So it isn't a question of uh, let's I'll use Israel again or Germany and the United States asking, uh, you know, for information where we've dealt for so long, this trust between them. I do believe that both of these countries, U.S. and China, are at daggers drawn. And I think China does believe that uh, that we are asking for it because uh, open it to WHO and so on. And they're not going to do that, which doesn't mean, in my opinion, that we can't have projects to build trust and that we can't together work uh, to control uh, the pandemic uh, and implant it in an international body like COVAX, which is the World Health Organization's uh, pandemic uh, vaccination procedure for poor and uh, you know, developing countries. So I don't think that's exclusive. So on the one hand, I do believe that China tried to hide that. Secondly, I don't really think that uh, they're uh, thinking that we're asking for all this because we just want to know the truth. They're thinking we're asking for all this because we want to get a leg up and hit them on the head. That's my feeling. Yeah. I don't think that should stop us from trying to uh, build a joint command. Yeah, I think motivations are difficult. It seems like there is a scientific argument, though, about wanting to have the best evidence uh, for the purpose of global health, uh, that regardless of how justified China's mistrust may seem to be, sure. um, you know, it is impeding the ability of uh, scientists and experts around the world from understanding um, the origin. So I realize now, uh, as much as I'm really enjoying this conversation, that we only have a few minutes uh, left. I'm wondering if I can maybe try to get uh, two more uh, questions in. Uh, the first one I, I want to ask is, um, you talked a little bit before about how you saw AUKUS in a positive light because it's it made clear uh, the United States' vital interests in the region and was a way of, of countering uh, the report that you wrote has very little of that in it. It is mostly about potential avenues of future cooperation uh, between the United States and China. And, you know, many spend or emphasize much more strongly the places where we're concerned about China's behavior. And you mentioned already the East and Ch South China Seas uh, and also uh, China's uh, militarization of these, um, particularly the South China Sea. China's efforts to isolate and pressure Taiwan, uh, China's aggressive suppression of democracy in Hong Kong after having agreed to the two systems for a sustained period of time. Um, also, it's a really state-directed uh, policy that uh, favors certain in industries and sees acceptable the use of state-directed espionage and other techniques in order to advance those industries at the expense of competitors. I mean, given this litany, and there's probably others that could be on that list, uh, do you have other recommendations about how the United States ought to be uh, pushing back? I think my biggest recommendation would be that the United States needs to sit back and take a deep breath. Let me tell you why I think that. There has never been, to my knowledge, a developing country that has not spied on a developed country. I mean, this is nothing new. It's happened since the days of the pharaohs, right? I'll give you another example. I'll use uh, Israel again. They didn't have atomic weapons. Where did they steal them from? The technology, the United States, right? You look at how the first mighty billionaire in America, Carnegie, made his money. That was the Bessemer process, right, of making steel, which he perfected, deployed around the country. Well, that was came out of uh, Britain, and if I remember correctly, uh, Norway. But it was perfected here and used here, right? We can go back to the light bulb, right? That, that came out from Tesla. He didn't, you know, perfect it and deploy it. So stealing technology is nothing the Chinese invented. I think that we ought to look inside. I mean, we're supposed to be the technological leader of the world. Can't we even stop the Chinese hackers from coming in, these guys sitting in high school desks and breaking into the 
uh, you know, big corporations in America. So I, I you know, I'd, I'd look at it from 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 that perspective. Yeah, but, I would, yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate. I do think that there's an argument to be made that that it would be easier to stop uh, Chinese high schoolers than to, to stop mass massive state directed, state supported, nation state. Uh, hacking in cyberspace, but that that's probably a whole different uh, potential interview. I, I want to just end perhaps on um, one last parallel perhaps between the telegram and Kennan's original long telegram. You know, when you read that long telegram and even the, the follow on article, Sources of Soviet Conduct, he kind of ends on a note that, that, that actually goes along well with your uh, recent statement of take a deep breath because he sort of ends on a note that says the best way that the United States can uh, preserve its interests and values in the context of the Cold War is to live up to its own highest uh, aspirations. Every problem that it solved, in fact, let me just read what he says. He says, every courageous and inclusive, incisive measure to solve internal problems of our own society, to improve self-confidence, discipline, morale, and community, spirit of our own people is a diplomatic victory over Moscow we're worth a thousand diplomatic notes and joint communiques. When you think about that parallel between the Soviet Union in 1946 and perhaps as a competitor, if not as clearly a potential Cold War adversary that the China today, do you think that that parallel has merit? Do you think that there that we should think again today about if we're concerned about competition with China, uh, the best approach is to uh, think about what we need to do at home? Thank you for that question. I, I do believe in that. Uh, I mean, look, I wouldn't want to live in any other country, right? This is my chosen country, and I love it, respect it, honor it. Uh, there is no other country that I would like to live in. Let me just tell you uh, something I heard, which will answer your question much better than I can on my own. We have huge, America has huge strengths. And I was listening to a conversation by the former uh, foreign, uh, foreign minister of Singapore uh, some weeks ago. And Suzanne, here's what he said. He said, you know, America needs to think about strengths that only it has. And he talked about the uh, landing on Mars. Remember, we had this drone that, that flew up in the Martian atmosphere for the first time. And he said they showed the inside of the NASA control room. And he said, do you remember that the woman who ran this drone was from Myanmar? He said there were two guys from India, one from Bangladesh. There were Africans in there. He said it was like the United Nations. He said the Chinese landed a module on, on Mars a few days later, right? And they showed the inside of their room. And what did you see? All you saw were people from China. And he said, America should never forget that China has 1.3 billion people that it can draw its talent from. But America trolls six and a half billion people. The entire world is open for America because of the regard people have for that. So I only mention that because we have huge strengths and we need to exploit those. But we are hung up in this business of China as an enemy. I mean, what can I say? That's where I'd like to uh, uh, end my answer to you. And I think it's a wonderful place to end not only that answer, but actually this conversation. Uh, Sarwar, it's been a great pleasure to be with you today. Thank you very much. Well, Suzanne, you have uh, gone out of your way to help. And I really was uh, dreading the questions you would come up. I know your examinations at West Point, but I can breathe a sigh of relief, I think. Thank you so much. We'll Thank say you. goodbye. Goodbye.